People are coming over to drink the beer. Come back in six weeks. The beer's not ready yet. They're getting over here in a hurry. They, they gotta wait. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another Beer Brew Review Day. Today, we are going to be doing a little bit different, a little bit advancing in my brewing career. I'm moving on to a brew in a bag system. A brew in a bag, B-I-A-B. Uh, basically, these are muslin bags. You pretty much get grains, you put them in the muslin bags, do a bunch of stuff to it, and you end up with your war after that just as if you had used an extract kit. Um, so I think this is gonna be a lot of fun. I've never done this before. But if you wanna get into a system like this, you do need a couple extra supplies. There's not many. I don't know how easy or difficult this is going to be because I've never done it before, but Let's get started. Basically, for the Bruna bag system, you do need to have not only the muslin bags, you need a very large stock pot. Now, this is only a three gallon system. We'll go into what that is in a minute, um, or what, what exactly we're making here in a minute. But it's a three gallon batch. For this to work, though, I need five and a half gallons of water to start out with the recipe calls for because a lot of the water boils off during a lot of this process. And because of that, I didn't have a stock pot that was big enough. The one that came with my original kit was only a five gallon stock pot. I needed a bigger one. So I was actually gonna do this recipe a while ago, but I had to get a, a pot. Now I have, this is a 32 quart stock pot. So in it currently, I have my five and a half gallons of water that I'm going to be needing for this. But I wanted to bring it over here and show you guys, you do need a little bit of extra equipment, as well as this came with the kit that I bought for the brew in a bag kit. Um, comes with your little mesh housing that you're going to see how to use that later. And it came with some muslin bags. It also came with the uh, caribou slobber brew in a bag, three gallon kit. Came as part, or three gallon brew system. Came as part of this kit that I got. Again, I got this from Northern Brewer. I'll have a link for it. And then everything else I have here, we're going to go through what I need for my brew day today. So pretty much I've got the pot. The filter, the muslin bags. I do have a standard old, you know, bungan airlock here. I'm going to need a hydrometer. I'm going to need a thermometer. A thermometer is actually very important for this because you got to get things to certain temperatures for certain parts of this. So we'll go through that as we go through this video. And I got standard old, you know, spray bottle full of star sand here. I've got my primary fermenting vessel currently filled with star sand and some of the other equipment I might need in here. Now, one other thing that I did, or two other things that I did. One, I have a wort chiller now. I uh, Somebody was giving away a bunch of their beer brewing supplies, and I went and acquired them very happily. One of the things on there was a wort chiller. So I've never used this before, but hopefully this will speed up our process. And stirring vessels. But if you notice on this one, I took and I made markings all through this one. What I did was I put different gallon markers, uh, one gallon increments into this pot and then I stuck this down on the side inside the pot and I marked where my gallons were at. So I have a one gallon, two, three, four, five, and six gallon markers all the way up here. So now I know exactly how to fill up this pot because unfortunately there's no uh, markings on the inside of this one. You might get one that has a sight glass. You might get one that has the markings on the inside. I didn't, so I had to make my own. So this is what I'm going to use. and. It's going to make it a lot easier to fill and know how much water I've lost during the, uh, the brewing process as well. But basically, that's all the equipment that we have right now. Let's get started into making this caribou slobber brew in a bag. By the way, what comes in this kit is some, uh, some yeast. I had this in the fridge. I just pulled it out. It comes with some of the priming sugars, but we're not going to use those because I'm going to be kegging this again. But if you're bottling, you're going to need these at the end of the process. Uh, it comes with... Here is my grain. I got milled grain. You can get the unmilled version and mill it yourself. But this is the grain that we're going to be using instead of extract. And it came with two packages of hops. It comes with some uh, U.S. Willamette hops as well as some uh, U.S. Golding hops. Now, sadly, the instructions that came with this kit never told me when I was supposed to add those to the system. I found a different instruction kit online that I think I can know when, but it also had a third hop for this particular recipe. And I looked and it does not have that third hop in here listed on the ingredients or anything. So I'm not really sure. We're gonna kind of wing it using part of that other recipe kit, but uh, we'll, we'll see what's going on. All right guys, let's get to brewing. 
All right, everybody, so the first step in this kit is to get five and a half gallons of water up to 160 degrees. Now, this is for the mashing process, and the mashing process is when the grains go into the water and the starches get broken down into simple sugars that can be eaten by the, the yeasts and therefore make us the beer that we love and enjoy. But to do that, we need to, that's the mashing process. To do that, we need a mashing temperature, and for this particular kit, it's 153 degrees. It suggests that you go about seven or eight degrees higher, that as you add everything, it's gonna rest at 153 degrees, and you're gonna have to do that process. The mash is gonna last for either 60 or 90 minutes, depending on the recipe. Uh, this particular one is 60 minutes, so it's only gonna rest for 60 minutes. But while we're getting this thing up to the right temperature, I figure I'll show you guys this little setup here and how big this stock pot actually is. It's quite large. Inside is five and a half gallons of water, even though this is a, such a large stock pot, it's already, you can see, there's a water's damn near the top of that thing. But I'm also gonna show you while we wait, this system right here, in case you didn't understand what I was saying before, there's no sight glass or anything on this pot. There's no markings on the inside of this pot to show how much water is in here. And not that this is necessarily important for this particular recipe. I figured it'd be good for the future anyways. But I basically put in one gallon increments and then marked this thing for like one, two, three, four, five, six. So as you can see now, if I drop this thing down at the very bottom and rest it against the edge, I'm between the five and the six is where the water lies. So that's five and a half gallons of water in here. So this is a quick and easy measurement tool. So now let's kind of see where we're at. We might be close. I've been getting this thing up to temperature for about 30 minutes now. It takes a while to get these things up to temp. And so let's see where we're at. Last time I checked, it was at 139. So we could be close. Not quite there yet. We are getting close. It takes a long time to get water up to to heat this much water up to 160 degrees. So we got another maybe 10, 15 minutes to go. So I'll put this thing back on and I will join you guys again when we're at 160 degrees. All right, folks, it's been about 10 more minutes and I think we're just about there. Let me check and make sure. Perfect, 106, actually it's 161 degrees now. So I'm gonna turn it off. I don't know if you guys saw that fast enough. It drops pretty quick. So I'm gonna turn that off. And I know you don't want your mash to get too hot. I don't want it to get up to 168 or 170 degrees and then add my uh, my grains because that's actually a mash out temperature. And I believe that stops the process. And you do it to yield higher efficiency uh, from the for your beer. Therefore, get it you know more alcohol, better percentage. Uh, so yeah, I'm sitting at 161 degrees. And I'm pretty happy with that because within a one degree tolerance, I'm okay with that. So now we have to start the next part of the process, which is... So now the next part of the process is getting our muslin bag into the pot. Now you're going to need a way for this muslin bag to actually hold on to the pot. And a lot of people use simple binder clips. Amazingly, I don't have any binder clips around the house. I don't know why, but I do have these other types of clips. Um, much more heavy duty. Uh, I actually use this one as a door chalk and I'm at the fire station hooked to my gear and then I get to the door and I can prop it open if we're ever in a fire, but this is going to work perfectly for this purpose. It's just an overkill. So if you see these huge clips, you don't need anything fancy. So pretty much I need to get this thing into the pot all the way down to the bottom. I'll use my fancy stir. We'll do that. I will then Make sure it's over the edges here. There we go. And then I'm going to use, I don't know if I can get it over both of these handles. Ah, yeah, there we go. That's actually, it's actually really nice. It's making some crazy noise too. I actually use these, clip them here on each of the handles. Make sure it doesn't go anywhere as well. Take big mama clip, put it right there in the back. I actually only have the two or the three. I don't have four of them here, but this will work. And now I got to get my grains. Now in this part of the process, from what I understand, you got to be really careful not to let a lot of clumps form. So you kind of add it slowly and stir. I don't know how easily I'm going to be able to do that on my own, but I'll start to add some. Okay. 
and then I will stop and I will stir. And I will continue this process to make sure we don't have any big clumps forming in here. Especially I seem to have some pockets that formed into the bag itself that the, some of the grain has gone down into. So I ought to make sure I get that part stirred up appropriately and hopefully form this more to the edges so that as I add more grain, there's no more pockets that grain's jumping into. Ooh, it smells delicious. I'm going to stir this extremely thoroughly and then what I'm going to have to do is check the temperature and make sure we're sitting right about 153 degrees which is the mashing temperature and then we're going to let it sit here for an hour. Now to do that I'm going to put the lid back on uh, to retain the heat but I'm probably going to have to remove this big clip in the back because I just realized that the lid's not going to go on. But these ones are fine because it's on the handle so it's actually perfect. Now I don't feel like I have any clumping problems going on in here. Everything looks quite thoroughly stirred. I really want this beer to turn out well though, so I'm trying to ensure that I didn't miss anything. So, I'll have you guys take a look at what this is. Yep, I feel like it's done a pretty good job. And then, let's check this temperature. I don't know how well this pot is going to hold the, uh, the temperature. So we're gonna have to check it periodically throughout. It's like perfect. It's pretty much bang on to where it's supposed to be. 152.7, I can definitely call that close to 153. So now I'm going to remove, huge clip, keep it on the side as well just in case, and put a lid on this thing and set a timer for 60 minutes and that was the wrong button we'll get this thing going don't worry so 60 minute timer and we will come back and check on our beer all right folks we're coming up on the 20 minute mark of this mash and i'm going to check the temperature to see what range we actually happen to be sitting in Make sure we're retaining enough heat to see if I need to add any more heat or anything like that. And... Oh, we seem to be doing okay. We're at 151 and a half degrees. Right now I'm gonna say that that's good, uh, but I'm gonna check again in about 20 more minutes and see if we drop below 150, 151, I'll add a little bit of heat to this stir it up until we get back up to 153 degrees so uh we got about about 40 minutes left in this match so i'll uh, keep an eye on this all right so just about 15 to 20 minutes left in my boil 17 actually is the magic number um or excuse me in the mash not the boil i checked this thing about 10 minutes ago and it had just gotten to just over 150 and yeah, we do appear to have lost some temperature. So we're sitting at like 149. So just below where I want it to be, but I want to make sure I do this right. So I'm going to turn this thing on low heat. 
and I'm going to stir while it's on low heat because I don't want to burn anything, but I do want to make sure that I get this thing to the right mashing temperature so that this turns out as good as it possibly can. Uh, I knew I might run into this problem with this pot. This pot, it's very thin walled, uh, which is, is nice because it makes it light. And it was actually quite cheap. It was only like $10 or something like that on, online. And usually these pots run for a lot of money. Um, and by a lot, I'm talking, you know, anywhere between, you know, 30 to $50 is where I saw a lot of them for. And when I saw this one, it was like $8.99 or something like that. Uh, I couldn't pass it up, even though I knew it was a very thin pot. But it's okay. We're going to make do with it. It just makes it so I'm going to have to potentially add some more heat. All right, I have been able to bring this back up to 152 and a half degrees. Uh, I'm happy with that for it's supposed to be at 153. There is 11 minutes left in this. I'm going to turn the heat back off. 11 minutes left in this mash. And I might let it go for about 15 minutes because I lost a couple minutes while we're getting it back up to temperature. So I'll see you guys when this thing's over. Okay, we're, so we're sitting at 30 seconds left in this mash period. Uh, so I'm happy with the way that that all went. What I'm going to do is an optional step right now called the mash out. The mash out is when you take the temperature up to a between 168 and 170 degrees, depending on the recipe kit. This one specifically says 168. Um, let me turn the timer off here. And you let it rest there for 10 minutes. Now what that does is it stops the action of the enzymes that were doing that starch conversion into the simple sugars. And by stopping that action, Apparently, what it will do is it will yield higher efficiency of your beer. It's an optional step. You don't have to do it. They say it won't hurt your beer if it doesn't, or if you don't do it, but it can help it to do it. So I figure, why not? Let's, let's do it while I'm here. So I'm just going to bring the temperature of this up to 170 degrees. And once we get there, we're going to let it sit there for 10 minutes, and then we're going to start the process of beer. So we've now reached 168 degrees. I'm going to turn the heat off. And we let it sit for 10 minutes for the mash out phase. All right, so our 10 minute mash out has pretty much come to an end. The timer's got eight seconds left on it. So now we're gonna start preparing to remove this bag. It's what's called, there it is. Timer off, clear. Uh, so this is called the, it's called laudering. Basically you lift the mesh bag out of here, the muslin bag, you put it in a strainer and let it drain and that finishes this process. After this process, we essentially have what you would get from an extract kit, and we use that to just start going with the rest of it. So, it's gonna be hot when you do this, so you gotta be really careful and loud, apparently, when you do this. So, the edges of my bag actually are not too bad, but it is definitely warm. Ooh, now it's getting really, really hot as well so pretty much I'm gonna lift this let it drain as much as possible until I can hopefully capture it into this and arrest this across my pot there we go I'm gonna make sure it doesn't spill everywhere or dump back in. But I can let it rest here for a little bit, get all those drippings out of there, and then we can start with our normal brewing process of starting up that boil, adding our additions, etc. So I'm gonna let this drain for a little bit. I'll see you guys in a minute. Okay, so I've let this drain for a little while. Now it's time to move it out of the way. You can also do that in a secondary container, uh, like one of your your fermentation vessels and then pour the wort or the the excess back into the uh into the pot but i said that was easier just to put it on top of it so it drips right back down in and now i'm just going to have this to the side to discard the grain in some way shape or form but then i have a bag that i can reuse later so now that now that that process is complete pretty much we're going to start to do the normal beer process. So I'm going to start bringing this thing up to a boil. That thing is on. Move that strainer to the side. And I do read in some places that you can do a pre-boil 
reading on this. So why not? Let's do a pre-boil reading. I don't have anything else to do on my hydrometer. I don't have anything else to do while I wait for it to come up to speed. So now at this stage, keep in mind that we're going to bring this stuff up to a boil. So I don't have to have all sanitary equipment touching this. I didn't have this in sanitizer, it's clean. You don't want dirty equipment in there, but it doesn't need to necessarily be sanitized because everything's gonna get brought up to a boil. Um, if you're gonna transfer it like this, which is not the ideal way to do this, it, it's very hot, so be careful. I unfortunately just don't have a small, like, water thief or anything to, to utilize right now. It's also extremely hot where I can't do my pre-boil reading too well from here because it's going to be way out of the range. So I'm going to collect enough for it and then I'm going to take this and let it cool to room temperature, but it's going to be my, my pre-boil amount. Now at this point, keep in mind that the biggest thing that we're concerned with is boil over. I'm not starting from nothing. I'm starting from just about 170 degrees, maybe a, a couple degree drop because of just the length of time that it took for the, uh, the mash out process. But, there you go, that should be plenty. Put that to the side. So we're gonna let that get prepared. And so I really gotta watch this for boil over. Boil over is when, at the hot break point, right when everything does start to boil, it has the tendency and possibility of just coming out of the pot and getting everywhere. Keep in mind, the whole process up until this point was based around turning this into a sugary solution so that the yeast, when you put them in, they'll convert those sugars into alcohols. So this is a really sugary solution, meaning if it gets everywhere, it's going to be a sugary and sticky mess, and you don't want any part of that. The very first beer that I brewed using an extract kit, I didn't watch it close enough and it boiled over and it took forever to clean that up. So keep an eye on that. Right now, I'm gonna let this thing come up to a boil and we're gonna to prepare to add hops, our additions that we need and go for the 60 minute boil. So we're right about to that point where I gotta really be careful about this hop break and looking for boil over because we are sitting at 200 and approximately 206, 207 degrees right in that area. Uh, keeping in mind for Fahrenheit, the boiling point of water is 212 degrees. So at this point, I'm gonna remove the lid so I can watch this more closely. Put it in the sink over there. And I don't want to, you don't use the lid in your boil most of the time. Some people say as the as everything boils, it's putting you know sediment that it would otherwise release and different types of enzymes and things like that. They boil out of the pot and that's why you lose a lot of your, your liquid volume. And putting the lid on, it just drains that stuff right back into the beer. Some people say that that's bad. Uh, I've never really seen definitive exact reasons, but it looks like for the most part, people leave the lid off when doing their boil. So I'm gonna do that. Uh, I did also do a, a uh, a reading of my amount of liquid that was in there. Um, as you can see that my numbers already have started to wash off. So this is not gonna be a permanent solution, but we were at five gallons before I started the uh, boil process or the process of bringing this up to boil. And that means we lost a half a gallon of water somewhere between what's in the grains as well as what, you know, kind of evaporated off just from heating. So we're probably gonna lose a significant amount more from what they say, it's gonna get down to between a three and a three and a half gallon yield at the end of this. So we're gonna lose approximately two more gallons just to the boil. So it is all accounted for in the numbers by losing that, that amount. So it's not a big deal. Now with the lid is off, this thing is actually not, it actually slightly went down in temperature probably because there was a big steam layer on top that was also incorporating the reading. So I'll come back to you guys momentarily right when this thing starts to boil. So this is just about ready to boil. You can start seeing that it's some bubbles are forming. It's about 210 degrees. So we're going to hit that boil point and that hot break at any minute here. Uh, if you guys can take a look at that, I'll try to keep you guys in here for when we actually hit that hot break. 
so you can figure out how to how to take care of it here. All right, it is or about there. You can probably see in that one side over here. It's really starting to uh, to bubble. We're gonna hit that hot break here momentarily. So now is when you got to be prepared. Now, what you want to do to stop the boil over is you want to be ready to stir as well as be ready to adjust the heat because that is what's really going to prevent the boil over from happening. Once it starts to boil and you hit that hot break point, that is not when you want to start your 60 minute boil timer either. You want to wait till you get a nice rolling boil. Uh, like it's basically the point right past that break when everything kind of settles down and it comes into equilibrium and it, it starts going on that boil process. After that, until you're making additions and things like that, you don't have to worry as much about a hot break. It's once it settles, it's most likely not going to boil over. But always be safe and always pay attention if you have something over an open flame. Don't walk away and go to the store or anything like that, obviously. Use your head, be safe. But, as you can see, we are, again, still still continuing to boil just in that one corner. This is going to spread through the rest of the vessel here momentarily. Well, maybe today's my lucky day or maybe it's my unlucky day. I'm not really sure, but I don't really appear to have hit this top break point. Uh, the, we've had a pretty sustained rolling boil for at least 10 minutes now. So I'm going to start the timer and go from there and just keep an eye on it for a little bit. But So now I want to get the timer up to a 60-minute timer. And keeping in mind that there are certain things I have to do at specific times. Like I need to add my hops at certain time increments. Now, if you ever get a recipe that says that like this one in particular, US Golding is the first hop edition and it says next to it 60 minutes. I'm gonna make sure I'm getting the, the right one here. Yeah, US Golding's for 60 minutes. When it says 60 minute, it means to add it at that much time left in your boil because it needs that much time to boil in your, in your work. So basically 60 minute boil or 60 minute time on this means add it when you're at the 60 minute boil. My next hop edition, my only other hop edition is actually the uh, Willamette and it's at 15 minutes. So I have to wait all the way down to we have 15 minutes left in the boil to add that. So let's open up my, oops, tear back. I don't need to do anything. So let's open up this. And now this is another point where you're really supposed to watch out for the hot break uh, when you add ingredients. So we gotta be careful here. Oh, the smell of hops is so delicious. So let's get these added into here. And that you can see, that got a little bit more aggressive of a boil going on. Not crazy though. Not in danger of boil over range right now. I will watch it for a minute, but it seems to be also calming back down. So let's just give this a stir. And then basically, for the next half an hour, the next 45 minutes actually, I uh, just make sure it doesn't boil over and we come back for our next top edition. All right, everybody, 15 minutes left in the boil. It is time to add our last hop edition, which is the U.S. Willamette. I don't know how you say that, actually. Uh, Willamette, Willamette. Either way, it's hop. It's delicious. And we are going to open this up. Mmm, God, they smell so good. Mmm, so delicious. Let's get these added in there. Make sure this doesn't boil up. But obviously started a little bit more vigorous of a boil when I did that. Uh, there's one more thing I'm going to do in today's, uh, today's brew that is not part of the actual kit. And that is adding of a teaspoon of Irish moss. Now, Irish moss doesn't do anything about the taste of the beer, but apparently it clears up the chill haze that can happen when you like cool your beer down and get it to drinking temperature, it can release a haze. And so this is supposed to help prevent that just to give it more a, a more aesthetically, aesthetically pleasing look. Now, I got these from the same gentleman that I got the wart chiller from, and I'm gonna make use of them. Never used them before. So it's just a teaspoon per five gallons. This is probably just under five gallons at this point, but we'll get a teaspoon of this Irish moss. Not really have much of a smell to it, but we'll get this added in there as well. See if it can if it can do anything good for our beer. I'll give this thing a quick stir. And then because we're coming up toward the end of our boil, 
What I need to do at this point is get my wart chiller sanitized. And the way I can get it sanitized is instead of actually using sanitizer on it, I've got it all clean, make sure it's good to go. But what I can do is I can dip it right into the pot and the boiling water will sanitize it. Basically, when I first got this, it's a little, I think it's homemade. When I first got this, both of the ends on it were not where they're at now. I moved them up here. One end was right here and the other one was at the bottom and the expectation was that you hooked these up to it and put these up to it in the top and the bottom. I was worried that it was gonna leak a little bit so I bent them back up here. It's not the prettiest, I did it by hand. Uh, you gotta be really careful bending this stuff by hand because you can't do too tight of bends or it'll, it'll actually kink. Uh, but I think I did a pretty decent job of it. And I'm glad I did because when I tested it out, it definitely leaks from the water input. So I gotta make sure that that stays outside of the, there we go, that that's gonna stay outside of the boil kettle um, because I don't want it to actually start leaking the water in there. So now it'll leak the water into the sink because I'll probably do this in the sink. What I'm gonna do actually as well is I will probably add some sanitizer to it. Now, the way that this is designed is this hooks up to my sink and I have to get the piece. It's actually meant to hook up straight to a garden hose connection with this. So I wanted to get a garden hose to sink adapter. And I'll tell you that it was kind of a little bit more difficult than I anticipated. They sell adapters for it. They're quite cheap. It was like $6 on eBay. Uh, and people are coming over to drink the beer. Come back in six weeks. The beer's not ready yet. They're getting over here in a hurry. They, they gotta wait. So I bought this off of uh, Amazon for like $6 and I went to connect it to my sink and it didn't connect to the sink. Turns out most sink threads are, I think it's 55 64ths. The particular sink that I have is one of the ones that's slightly different and it's a three quarters inch connector. So I had to also buy a three quarter to 55 64th adapter and then connect that to the sink adapter, which then hooks to the garden hose. So eventually it did work. It just took me a couple weeks to actually get all the right parts because I didn't realize that I was gonna run into that as an issue. But while this is here, this is boiling, getting ready to go. I do want to get my sanitizer. Let me actually lift this up just a little bit so I don't get this in the beer. I want to sanitize just the, t the top of this. And if I get a little bit in the beer, it's not gonna matter. It's, uh, it's food grade, you can do it. Um, I just didn't want to do too much, but I want the top to be sanitized as well, just in case it touches the beer when I, the wart when I slash it around and things like that. Well, technically I think we're gonna, well, we have beer right when we put the yeast in, we don't have beer yet. So now I've been talking for long enough that we have approximately 10 minutes left in this boil. There's a couple other things that I have to do, one of which is the yeast and rehydrating my yeast. So, anyway, stored in the microwave. I had boiled some water earlier. I actually boiled double what I need, so I need to pour some of this out. I boiled it and I need to let it cool down to between, let me read, it's written right on the back of this particular yeast pack, but you can also do it dry. I'm just trying to yield more, you know, get more yield out of my yeast. And it says that the temperature range for this is between 86 and 92 degrees. So I really want to get this water down to 86 to 92 degrees before I add my yeast to it to start the rehydration process. Now, this is no longer going to be boiled. At, for this, at this particular point, I need to, anything that touches it has to be sanitary. So let me go make sure I dip this in star sand. Turn it on and let's see what temperature we are sitting at with this water. We're actually still hotter than what we need to be. So I need to hope that this gets cooled down. Let me dump it out to the amount I need, which is only four ounces instead of the eight that I have in here. It'll uh, help it cool a little bit easier. And I'll actually probably set it in the fridge. just for a couple minutes to let it get a little bit cooler. So basically I need to wait for this boil to end. I need to get my yeast rehydration or starting to get rehydrated because it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to do that process. And then we need to chill the wort, get it in my primary fermenter, add the yeast and wait. So hang tight folks. 
So I've now got my yeast right to the, or excuse me, my yeast solution right to the temperature that I want it at. It's at 95 degrees now, so we are perfect there. I'll put this to the side. And I put my scissors here in a little container of sanitizer, and I need to actually get the, the packet of yeast itself sanitized. And what I'm going to do is open this up, sprinkle it on top. I've seen a couple different methods for how this is done. Uh, but the one I'm going to use today says that you can sprinkle this on top and actually cover it and let it sit for 15 minutes and then stir it. So basically not to stir it right now, I'm not sure why. This is a fresh clean piece of aluminum foil that I had just pulled off. I'm going to cover this with it so nothing gets into it and we are going to set it just to the side. So in about 15 minutes or so, I can get that stirring. And we have less than 30 seconds left on our boil over here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the, the pot, move it here over to the sink, and start getting my wort chiller hooked up and ready to go. And hopefully this will be done, everything will come together at just the right moment to make the end of this process very, very easy. I'm going to wait the five more seconds that we have left. And now at this point, everything that touches that, sanitize. Set the timer off. Turn that off. Now this thing's going to be very hot. And it's still heavy. What I'm doing is I'm setting it in the sink. I want to make sure I'm not dripping my water into the... Uh, the water from the faucet, I'm not dripping it into the container, that's why it's off to the side. So now what I need to do is I need to hook this. I've already taken my my aerator end off of the sink, as it's right there. I'm gonna take these connectors I was telling you about, get them screwed into the sink. Okay, hopefully that is good and won't be leaking. Now I want to move these over here because I know like I said this one's gonna leak you'll probably see that momentarily it's hot be really careful this end I need to get over here into the sink because that's my drainage end that's where everything's gonna come out of so I want it to pour back into the sink not <laughs> into the beer on the floor and let's slowly turn this on okay cold water run on through here there we go. We are now... Sorry about the abrupt cut. I actually ran out of memory on the uh, memory card, so I had to go grab a new one real quick. So we got everything hooked up, and I had this thing turned on, and it was running. Nice cold water just coming on through here. And as you can see, I don't know if you can actually see it too well. Down here, it's the connection right where the water's coming from the faucet into the side of the uh, wart chiller. It is leaking a little bit. And that's exactly what I was worried about and why I didn't want this connection in my work because then all this water would just be trickling into the beer and it's not necessarily sanitary. It's going to be extra water and it could cause a lot of problems. So basically, I'm feeling how cold this water is that's coming out of here. And on this side, I can feel it and it's like, it's warm because this is the water's gone through the beer and absorbed a lot of the, or the wort and absorbed a lot of the heat from it. So I'm curious to uh, very quickly sanitize my thermometer here. What temperature we are sitting at. So it's at 184 degrees right now because uh, it's already been doing some decent work on getting this stuff going here. Let's take this end. Oh yeah, the uh, water coming out of the end of this. It's about 100 degrees, so it's, and it's ice cold. I just turned on the cold, so this is extremely cold. I, I can't measure the temperature of it right now, but needless to say, um, it's doing its job. So we're gonna let that sit there and cool my wort, which is gonna be great. I've never used a wort chiller before. I'm trying to get my face in the, in the camera so you guys can see me, but I want you guys to be able to see everything that's going on. Uh, we're gonna let this yeast do its thing. Actually, you guys can take a, a look at what's going on with it already. It's only been a couple minutes. Um, 
but it smells like yeast. It smells like bread, because uh, that's, I mean, that's a big mainstay in yeast. So, about 10 or 12 more minutes on that. We'll stir it up. We'll let it sit for another couple minutes. And hopefully by that time, it's all rehydrated and ready to go into the wort, in the fermenter. And then we will have beer. We just need to wait. Okay, the wort is just about at the right temperature. It's at like 84 degrees. I'm going to let it run for just a little bit longer here. Uh, I learned if I lift up and down on this thing, it would uh, help the temperature a lot more. It only took about 10 minutes. I don't want it to get too cold because I want it to stay within that temperature that it wants, which is like 64 to 70 degrees, somewhere in there. Uh, but at this time, we're going to look at our yeast. And the nice thing is, this yeast looks healthy and active. If you can see, there is a nice, you know, creamy film forming on top of it. Uh, unlike the last batch I did, which was not a susceptible batch, or not a good batch because of the yeast was bad, uh, it seems. So now I've sanitized this thermometer, the end of it. I'm just going to use it to stir. And we're going to let it sit for about 10 more minutes. And... While I get everything else done, basically, it should sit just long enough for everything else to get finished. So back over in the corner. And what I can do now is re-sanitize this thermometer. Let's see where we're sitting at in our work. And we're at just about 80, 83 degrees. So we are almost there. Going to let it keep running just for a minute. And by the time I transfer everything to the other container, it's probably going to lose enough heat from that. Um, I did pull out a turkey baster that, yes, I did sanitize. Um, I should have done this before, but basically we still have our graduated cylinder from our pre-boil uh, that I need to take a specific gravity reading of, especially, or as well as what I want to do now is my post-boil, but prior to yeast fermentation, I'm going to add from the turkey baster straight from there. Like I said, yes, it was sanitized. It was cleaned. It was sanitized. So this should be no problem. And what we can do is check our... our readings. I don't know if I needed the pre-boil one or not. I just saw that you can, so I figure why not while we have this stuff here. Let's go ahead and do that. So, we'll check our specific gravity reading of our pre-boil. And we are at 10... 1032 is where that one was at. Let's take this out. I'm not going to reuse this for anything, but I just want it to be clean. Whew. Dropping the thermometer. And now the boil amount, we are sitting at... It looks like about 1045. At 1045, I think that's a little bit lower than was expected. Yeah, well, the original gravity, it says it's supposed to be around 1052. So obviously we lost a little bit there, but not too big of a deal. But either way, now let us get, I'm going to turn this off. We're going to move this stuff out of the way. I'm going to get my wart chiller out of here. I think to do that, that was the pot. I'm going to get the wart chiller into the sink. We are done with the wart chiller and pretty much at this point, let's see if I can turn this in such a way where you guys can see. This is my sanitized primary fermenter. I'm using the one that has the connector on it. So the, basically the kit that I, I'm using, it comes with a fermenter for both the primary and the secondary stage and it actually wants this to be for the secondary because then you can go straight to bottles from this. I'm not doing a secondary fermentation stage, uh, at least not in the same way that I'm not doing anything that's going to involve ended up going into bottles either. So I think I'm going to do a primary fermentation for multiple weeks. I might do a secondary. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I'd have like two weeks to decide to do that. But if I decide not to, I want to be able to easily have this tap here that I can just pour it right into my keg. Um, I might not. I might still use the, the beer thief, but we'll find out. Uh, so it's already been sanitized, clean and sanitized. I have my extra solution over into this bucket here and for storage for later. And at this point, I can just take this and I'm going to pour it directly in instead of bothering to uh, 
Make sure you guys can see that. Yeah. Instead of using the a siphon. Yeah, try to leave the sediment behind if I can. The reason I'm doing this, and whether this is good practice or not, I don't know. I'm you know new into the industry. So as you can see, there's a lot of sludgy stuff down there at the bottom that I'm trying I'm gonna leave out. And I know if you use a siphon, it's a lot easier to leave some of that stuff out of here. But you have to aerate this anyways. So what I'm gonna do is make sure my lid has been fully sanitized all around. I'm going to close this and I'm just going to shake it around for a while just to aerate it. Keep in mind that right now since I don't have a, the bung lock in there as you can see things just splashed on me. So I don't have the bung lock in here it's going to splash around. So what I can really do is make sure my just dip my fingers in the sanitizer here. Take this. Basically, you need to aerate your beer before primary fermentation. It helps the yeast. It gives them an environment in which they can thrive in. So, I'm just going to make sure that this is done appropriately. And then, when we're done with this, I'm ready to pitch yeast and put this thing in the corner. Okay, so I aerated the wort for a while. And now I'm ready to add my yeast. Now, I checked the temperatures. This didn't come down to exactly the temperature I wanted. It wanted to be between 64 and 70. I reread the directions and it's at about 75. It, I don't think that's going to matter too much. I would ideally like it to get down there, but I don't want to wait too much longer because once you start to rehydrate yeast, you only have like a 30 minute window before the yeast starts to starve. And granted, I'm not quite to 30 minutes yet, but I don't want to risk getting too close and have the yeast end up dying because I didn't add them in time. So you also want your yeast to be about the same temperature as your beer. This is at 80 degrees, this is in mid 70s. I'm, uh, I'm relatively confident that that's gonna be okay because the procedure to get it back to all to the same temperatures, you start adding a little bit of your wort or some cooler water if it's sterilized and things like that into it to slowly bring up to the right temperature. With that little of a temperature difference between the two, I think it'd be, if I just dump this right on it in there, it's gonna be the same thing as adding a little bit of the wort over to here, in my opinion. Could be wrong, could be a mistake. I think we're gonna be fine. So basically at this point, I add my yeast. Close it up. Make sure it's nice and tightly sealed. I got my bung and airlock sitting in sanitizer right now. Um, and nicely because it was sitting in sanitizer, it is full of sanitizer. It's actually full of too much. I'm gonna dump a little bit of, of it out. It's not really a bung and airlock. I don't know why I keep calling it that. There's no bung involved. It's uh, going right into there. It is an airlock. So here's this particular airlock. It was right here. Let's make sure if I squeeze the sides. that we have a nice tight seal. It appears that we do. I'll be honest, you apparently don't need a seal. This is only to make sure things don't get into your beer. And that's what the airlock is for. I was always under the impression that they kept talking about the tight seal in the airlock and I thought there had to be almost like a vacuum in there that nothing could get in. There's actually procedures to ferment beer in the an open container you just got to stop debris from getting into it by covering it with like a muslim sheet essentially so even if it's not completely airtight as long as things don't get in that's the more dangerous part so pretty confident we're still airtight in here but you know i, I was just pointing that out because i didn't know that when i first started brewing so anyways guys i'm gonna put this in the corner for anywhere between one to two weeks for primary fermentation then one to two weeks for secondary i'm going to decide if i'm going to do a secondary ferment, uh, fermentation or not uh, i'm not really sure i might just let this go for four weeks in here and then transfer it right to the keg so we'll find out but anyways guys i will see you when we start to do other things with this batch uh, i will tell you that for brew day itself it's been about four hours so just to give you guys a time frame Starting this morning, getting things ready. I started about noon, actually. Getting things ready, getting things sanitized, getting uh, you know, getting all of my equipment gathered. I started about noon. It is just after 4 o'clock now. So to do all the steps that I did today, about a four-hour brew day. So just so you guys know. Stay tuned. Well, all right, everybody. It has been four weeks 
of primary fermentation for my caribou slobber brew in a bag. And uh, as you can see right on over here, if we can get this thing to zoom in a little bit, get it to focus. We are sitting at just about 1014 final gravity, which from the research I've done, this particular beer is supposed to be between 1014 and 1016 final gravity. So we are right on point. I have taken my a hose, connected it from my, you know, my tap here down into a keg cleaned and sanitized and ready to go keg cleaned and sanitized hose. And I am going to place this beer into this keg for about another week for just to let it sit for a secondary fermentation phase. And then I can actually sit there, charge this keg up, get it carbonated and enjoy my beer. So. There we go. I just got to slowly let this thing transfer to the other vessel. And I will bring you guys back when it's all in there. All right, so we've completed transferring as much as I'm going to be transferring here. As you can see where the line of that beer is. Keep in mind there's a five gallon keg. It's a three gallon kit. So we look to be on point. This is the... Um, like the nastier, sludgier part that's left behind that I'm not going to transfer over there into the beer. Um, so obviously, a lot of a lot of action happened to this thing. So pretty much at this point, I just need to remove this from here very carefully. Dip it back into the bucket so I can clean you up later. Take my my lid. Let me give this thing another quick dip in the sanitizer. It's already been in there once, but just to make sure, pop this big baby on, close it up. And right now I'm not going to worry about necessarily ensuring it's perfectly sealed and pressurized and clearing out the headspace and things like that. It's going to sit for another week for primary fermentation without, uh, or for secondary fermentation without any, uh, any CO2 on there. Then I'm going to charge it up, be ready to go, and this beer will be ready to enjoy very very soon well all right folks beer beer in the keg it is ready to get carbonated so uh, basically i have my uh my co2 canister here and as you can see i've cranked this baby up to uh, it's about 25 we need to get it up to about 30. this regulator is a little bit difficult to use i'll have to crank with it a little bit off camera but pretty much all i'm doing is i hooked it up i checked it all for leaks i uh one of the good ways to check this thing for leaks is to put the lid on you can spray around the top lid because this is where you're gonna get the most leaks and i actually often was getting a leak around right here on this one uh, this is just star sand that I'm spraying on there to see if there's any bubbles. I actually put some um, petroleum jelly, some food food graced food based gel type substance on there, and it actually helps keep it uh, keep the seal nicely. So I don't see any leaks. And I just turned on the the CO2 container, so it filled up the remaining space in this keg with the CO2. But you need to get the oxygen out of here. So I'm gonna let it release. Oh, it smells like delicious beer. Um, and you're going to let the CO2 canister fill this thing back up, hopefully without the oxygen that's in there. So pretty much. Now, I'm going to go put this thing in my keg fridge. Got the keg fridge. I just set it up outside. I haven't been running it in a while since I moved to this house. So this is ready to go. I just need to wait for it to carbonate. I can actually do a quick carbonation by keeping it up to 30, keeping it in the fridge. I can actually shake it around. If you do it right, if you can, you, you can't really hear it too well, but if you shake this thing around, you can actually hear the CO2 kind of force filling the keg as I shake it, as it uh, gets more room in the beer for it. But other than that, we are ready to drink some beer. So hopefully sometime, if I allow to do a long-term carbonation, I can let it go for a couple weeks at this and just see how it is. I might just let it sit for a couple hours at 30, shaking it around every so often, get it in the fridge because I want to sample this baby tonight. And I'll let you guys know how it is. So here we go, after a nice long hard day at work, it's finally time to try the brew in a bag caribou slobber. Now, as you can see, this is, um, it's a, it's got a little bit of cloudiness to it. Uh, not, not too bad, uh, but it does have a little bit of cloudiness to it. Um, it's been in my keg, running at about 25 to 30 PSI for about four days now. I just uh, cranked it down, 
release the extra pressure, put it down to the serving pressure of about three. It's coming out of there pretty foamy still because it's probably got to run through uh, first to get it settled down after I take a couple glasses. So it was difficult to get this beer because it was a lot of headspace. But otherwise, it looks, it looks delicious. It smells delicious. It doesn't have a very pungent odor. Um, it's not very strong. It's just a, a, a smell of beer. Mmm, pretty tasty. I got a, got a little bit of a bitter taste, a little hop taste in there. It doesn't smell, or it doesn't taste off at all. It tastes like beer. And I would call that a success. So, my first brew in a bag adventure. I'm not sure if this is better or worse than an extract kit, but... You know, I feel more accomplished because of what went into this beer, so I'm going to try to do a lot more all-grain brewing in the future. Um, so far, I think this is a success, so guys, cheers. I hope you guys have as good a luck as I did with a similar recipe, and stay tuned for the next episode when I don't know what I'm going to make yet, but it's going to be good. Mm -hmm.